Okay, thank you. Um, so I'm going to talk about innovation and the great divergence. Um, and um, I'm going to start really, there's two parts to the talk really. One is, when did the great divergence begin? Um, and then the other part is, how do we explain it? I'm going to use historical national accounting for the first question, and I'm going to use uh, growth accounting for the second question. So um, the first part is um, reacting to the um, sort of general um, question that arose in, and got a lot of attention in the great divergence debate, <coughs> which is when did uh, when did the uh, Western economies begin to have higher living standards, higher productivity? And of course, the the debate here was between some sort of came as a shock to most economic historians. I can remember coming across comments when it first published. Um, because European economic historians have sort of assumed that um, divergence had happened a long time ago. Uh, there was a sort of first phase, the age of capitalism, uh, certainly from about 1500 when um, there was capital accumulation going on. So there's already a devil's effect. Um, and then the Industrial Revolution is a sort of culmination when you get the transition to modern economic growth, steady, continuous growth. Um, and um, of course, this was challenged by the California School. <coughs> in bubbling under in the 1990s, with a lot of uh, writers already questioning that uh, Eurocentric account. Um, and um, it really came to a head in, in 2000 with. And Pomerantz's book, um, where he argued that there was no real difference between the leading regions of Europe and Asia as late as 1800. Uh, there were other writers on other parts of Asia claiming they were also no further behind. South India, you have parts of Japan. And of course, this is, this is a fundamentally quantitative claim. It only makes sense if you have numbers. <coughs> was one ahead of the other. You can't argue that on some qualitative grounds very easily. Um, uh, and yet there was very little quantitative evidence. Um, uh, but about the same time, you have uh, Angus Madison producing The World Economy, A Millennial Perspective, um, and he's setting out GDP per capita across the whole world from uh, 1,000 uh, to the present. However, uh, there's a lot of um, an element of conjecture in Madison's work. Um, so if you also want to be rude about Madison, you'll call it guesstimates. If you want to be really, really polite, uh, you'll say controlled conjectures. Uh, I, I tend to laugh the latter view, really, because uh, I think Angus had, you know, was well aware that his estimates were not the last word. But what he wanted to do was to stimulate people to um, go and improve upon them. Uh, he also didn't deal with another issue which I think was probably the most important aspect of the California school's work. I remember a conversation with Richard von Glan years ago on, on a boat tour in, in Istanbul where he said, well, I think really the really important thing of the California school is the regional variation. Um, because of course you have large empires in, in Asia, China, in regard it, empire in India, they're massively larger than European nation states. So if we look at 1600, you know, 160 million people in China, the leading European re region is the Netherlands, one and a half million. Now, uh, I've put some other numbers up there. You can see nowhere in Europe is there anywhere remotely comparable to China. And it's quite possible in that population of 160 million, somewhere there's one and a half million people who are just as rich as the Dutch. Um, so we have to take that on board. Now, dealing with the, the getting over the, the, the sort of conject, controlled conjecture aspect of the of Madison's data, I think there's now been a lot more work over the last couple of decades, um, actually going back to the data. Um, um, constructing 
uh, estimates more fully. Let's say the ratio of data to assumptions has increased uh, quite a lot. We also now have some GDP per capita estimates of the Yangtze Delta. Those of you who have been looking at the posters may have seen Wen uh, Jiajai's uh, estimates for the Yangtze Delta there. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about those in, in a moment. Um, <clears throat> so, what I want to do then is to look at the evidence on historical national accounting now and incorporating the regional variation. Um, and then, so that's the first part, and the second part is to use growth accounting to assess the role of innovation. So, um, <clears throat> this is why, uh, actually, when I first sent the title in, it said technology and the great divergence, and I changed it to innovation. I'm relying on the estimation of total factor productivity growth, and that is it's just generally um, more efficient use of inputs. Uh, although that has often been equated with technological change, of course, it has to include things to do with organization, like the introduction of the factory system, for example. What I want to uh, try to establish then is that uh, we'll see TFP growth was positive in China during the Northern Song Dynasty, uh, when, when China was, we think, the world leader. Then, in fact, it's predominantly negative in the Ming and Qing Dynasty. Inputs are being used less efficiently. Uh, in Northwest Europe, on the other hand, we'll, we'll see a path of rising total factor productivity uh, throughout, but starting in the going back to the, the Black Death. After the Black Death, we see positive PFP growth in Britain. I suspect it's also positive in the Netherlands, but we don't have data for that. We do have data for the Dutch Golden Age. Um, in the sort of 16th and 17th centuries. It's positive again in Britain um, pretty continuously from the mid 17th century and it accounts for most of the growth of GDP per capita during the transition to modern economy growth uh, at the time of the Industrial Revolution. So, first part then is <coughs> establishing what are we trying to explain? The, uh, you know, when does the great divergence begin. And here I'm really just um, relying on the idea that there's actually a lot more data around than people once thought. Um, perhaps not surprisingly, really, the elite were always um, literate. They often kept accounts. Many of the accounts have survived. They're there waiting for people to go into the archive and extract the information. So what information on them? all these variables um, and um, those can be utilized to calculate GDP. So I'm going to now uh, look at the second generation estimates, which I think are rather more, have a higher ratio of data to, uh, to assumption. Uh, I'll start with Europe um, and um, just highlight these Findings. I'll show you the data in a moment, but basically we get a reversal of fortunes between the Mediterranean region and Northwest Europe. So the Mediterranean region had been the center of economic activity in Europe going back to classical antiquity, um, and that continues through to the, um, to the, uh, to the Renaissance, really. Um, that's then followed by the rise of Northwest Europe, Northwest Europe sort of turns up and gets onto a growth path after the Black Death. Um, and then, um, then you have a great phase during the Dutch Golden Age, um, and then on into the British Industrial Revolution. So we'll see trend growth in Northwest Europe, uh, Britain and, and the Netherlands. You will see fluctuations, but without trend in Italy and Spain. So uh, this is this is what uh, Jack would call um, efflorescences. I think you have the growth, but then uh, it 
doesn't continue. And in fact, quite importantly here, it's followed by negative growth. So that if you, you actually get, you never get any further um, on in the development process. We can now add uh, other countries um, uh, listed here. Uh, Portugal, France, Sweden, Germany, and Poland. Okay, so here's the, um, the first point about this, this reversal of fortunes between uh, Britain, the Netherlands on the one hand, Northwest Europe, and Italy and Spain, two important large medieval, <coughs> sorry, uh, Mediterranean economies. So you'll see uh, a number of things we can highlight. Um, I think here's Italy, the grey line, it's sort of basically up and down, um, but not going anywhere. Same for um, the purple line is uh, Spain, uh, that's again going up and down. We get this trend in Britain is the black line, um, and it, the first sort of jump up is after the Black Death in the mid 14th century, by, by about 1400. Notice it's then on a, a sort of plateau until the next growth phase in the 17th century. Before that, you have the Dutch Golden Age. Um, and, and clearly, by the 19th century, there's been a massive reversal. The North West Europeans are substantially ahead of the Mediterranean continents. So that's the European Little Divergence. We can add these other um, European economies, and it doesn't really change the picture. Outside Northwest Europe, we're not seeing any trend because we're seeing these sort of um, Goldstonian uh, efflorescences, but no trend growth. Okay, uh, which is uh, point out uh, that the um, Portuguese data relying on uh, Nuno's work here with uh, John Rich. So that's what's happening in Europe. What about Asia? Here, here are sort of the main sort of findings are China is the leading Asian economy during the Sun Dynasty. It's overtaken by Japan in the 18th century. But of course, we have to worry about the difference in the size of these economies. We really need to take account of Chinese regional variation. Um, and um, my, in, a, in a paper in the Journal of Economic History with um, uh, Guan Hanwei and Li Dao Kui, uh, we made our first stab at this, which was to use, um, well, I'll, I'll give you the details of that uh, in, in, in a moment. Um, it's a sort of crude way of making an allowance for having um, one region above the average. Uh, but we're now able to check it against to other studies. Uh, I'll show you those in a moment. Here's um, from our Journey by History paper how we managed to um, deal with the, the issue of regional variation, the crucial aspect of the California school in my view. And so uh, the first thing we can see is um, China is the yellow line, and this is um, follows this path. Uh, it's quite rich. Um, if we thought of 400 1990 dollars as subsistence, this is coming in at about a thousand, which is two and a half times subsistence. That's really quite for, for, for the year 1000. Whatever that, that, that's, that's pretty good. Um, and I suspect that makes China the, the, the world's leading economy at that point. Um, but you'll see Japan, which was initially quite poor, coming in about five, six hundred, overtakes China um, in the 18th century. But here's where we have to worry about regional variation. It's Japan much smaller than China. Uh, so um, our, uh, the, the blue line here. It's really the same as the yellow line, but shifted up by 75%. The reason for that is, for 1820, um, there's um, uh, a 
benchmark study by Liebe Jong, Yana Van Zanden, uh, which says you know, the, uh, the Yangtze Delta is 75% richer than China as a whole. So if we just then project back with the Chinese series, it says, um, well, there's always going to be one, ec one economy within China that is about as rich, where the scale of the increase over the China average uh, now, we can check that against two other studies, uh, uh, which are sort of not yet published, but the um, first one is uh, a study by myself and Tuan Han Wei. We uh, <coughs> decided to, to, to try a, a, a breakdown of Chinese GDP and Chinese GDP per capita. Um, into seven macro regions during the Ming and Qing dynasties, uh, and these are the black dots. Um, or for, we've also, as well as doing the seven macro regions, um, East Central China is still contained, it's still a very large economy, it's one of the macro regions, so we've also done it for the Yangtze Delta. And the Yangtze Delta uh, is, is the black dot here. And it does seem to track reasonably well the, uh, uh, the blue line. Um, and we also did a, a separate estimate for um, Python 2. Uh, that's the area around the capital region in the northern Song Dynasty. Um, that's a little bit higher. Probably more importantly is the green line, which comes from uh, Ranjo Jai's uh, estimates of a continuous series of GDP per capita for the Yangtze Delta. If you want to find out how that was constructed, it's on the poster there. Um, so I suggest you have a look. Uh, I, I can't spend more time on that, but I think it's very good. Um, uh, and it's basically we're getting pretty much the same. Um, store, I think. So here's my picture of the Great Divergence then, um, which uh, starts probably around about 1700. Here. So um, before that, um, if we were to look around about uh, 1400, we wouldn't say there's a Great Divergence here. Then. Because although Europe is ahead of China as a whole, yeah, the leading region of China, which, which is, at that point is, is surely the Yangtze Delta, is above Britain and the Netherlands. Uh, it's clearly true until we go into, um, you, know, you might say, well, there's a bit of a gap opening up here, but. Um, but still, by, by the end of the, or by the beginning of the Qing dynasty, uh, the Yangtze Delta seems to be keeping up with uh, Northwest Europe. It's only after that that we get a decline in GDP per capita. Uh, and uh, Northwest Europe and accelerating growth. So uh, that is, for me, the, the, the starting point when we're beginning to see a substantial gap in living standards and productivity between the leading regions of Europe and then the So the question now is why? And um, I'm going to use growth accounting for that. Is this because of more accumulation or is it because of um, technological progress, other forms of innovation? which we measure by total tractor productivity. I'm sure you've all seen the equation something like this uh, for explaining the growth of output. So that's extensive growth. Um, it depends on the growth of the uh, raw labor input, that's the L, uh, human capital H, fixed capital K, and land R. 
because you know, this, these are largely agrarian economies that we're going back to some like the 14th century. And then um, total factor productivity growth is, um, is measured as a residual. The weights for each of the factors are essentially the input shares in the cost of production. But really, we're going to be more interested in the intensive form uh, of growth accounting, which is to look at, uh, we want to explain not the growth of output, but the growth of output per person, GDP per capita. So that, that's a small y, um, where yeah, the, growth of out, the growth of output minus the growth of the population. And we're using then the um, sort of capital deepening term, little k, so that's the growth of capi capital per person, human capital per person, that's little h, land per person, that's little r, and then still, of course, the total factor of the efficiency with which inputs are being used. Let me start with the British data. Well, we, we probably have the, the best set of estimates available. So for the labour input, we have not just the population, which is what has widely been used in long-run studies of uh, growth accounting, but also we've got days work per person per year. So that's the sort of capturing the industrious revolution. Um, and, um, then we have human capital which is based on the work of Sander the Clyde, the, on the average years of education. Uh, for fixed capital, we're using um, the fixed capital excluding dwellings. Um, so Sander and I have been estimating the British capital stock for a long time now. Um, uh, we did put out a discussion paper um, earlier uh, last year. Um, so we're using that. and. The, Cultivated acreage comes from the study of British economic growth, 1270 to 1870, uh, and 2015. Uh, so, um, the, the weights come from Crafts and Ben and John uh, Essentially, we've, we've allowed, we've sort of tweaked what happens in the 1830s when the share of capital uh, rises uh, from 20% um, to 30%. Sort of commonly used in the literature. Uh, sort of summary overview of this is that if we want to explain British GDP growth, that's just the growth of output, then total factor productivity growth is not very important. It must tend to be driven by the total factor input growth, that's the weighted average of the inputs. Um, so GDP is declining after the Black Death, remember the population is falling by 50 to 60 percent uh, between the 1340s and the 1450s. Um, and then you have recovery uh, from the 1450s as population uh, recovers. So for GDP growth, total factor voluntary growth, innovation, if you like, is not terribly important. Um, we can just um, <coughs> decompose what's happening to the total factor of inputs. So this is just to sort of emphasize, you can see the importance of population growth. This is the key driver of what's happening to output. It's not surprising. It's the population is halving. That's really going to have an effect on total output. Um, and um, then it recovers from the 1450s. Um, when you get such a sharp fall in uh, in population, as you get after the Black Death, um, what you find is an increase in um, in, the, in in all the um, the begins a decrease in the level of all the inputs. Less land is used, for example. But on the other hand, as we'll see in a moment, land per person has increased. So, uh, so, so that's why, in a sense, the, um, 
the uh, population is the key driver, leading to output falling uh, through the 1450s and then recovering uh, afterwards. Um, but really, we're interested, as I say, in GDP per capita, for the great divergence debate. And we can now see that actually, having factor productivity growth, innovation plays quite a crucial role in explaining what's happening to GDP per capita. So uh, let's, let's turn to the data on that then. Um, how do we explain the path of GDP per capita growth? Um, is it inputs per capita or is it total factor productivity growth? Well, you can see that actually TFP growth is a very important driver of growth in GDP per capita whenever GDP per capita growth is positive. So that is the 1340s to 1400s, after the Black Death, TFP growth is accounting for almost half of the GDP per capita growth. And then again, all the periods from the 1640s on, uh, 1640s to 1690s, it's, it's more than half. Um, 1690s to 1830s, notice this is the crucial period, this includes the Industrial Revolution, 0.31 percent boost to GDP per capita from innovation. Only 0.03 percent from the inputs per capita. So TFP growth, innovation is really important uh, in, in explaining positive GDP per capita growth. Uh, and we can see how how is this sort of working through by decomposing the what's happening to the total factor input per capita. After the Black Death, then you know, basically if you survived, you've won the lottery. Okay? Because the Black Death has killed off the people and you've, not the land, not the capital. Um, and um, so the survivors are able to accumulate more. Um, they're also a even able to take more leisure. You'll notice the work days per capita actually declined in that period. Um, but then when the population recovers in the 1450s, man per capita, per capita uh, starts to sort of drift down. It's, it's largely uh, negative. In, the, in this period, um, but uh, human capital per capita again is, is increasing, but at, at a at a decreasing rate uh, until we get to the 1830s. Um, fixed capital is is um, growing uh, very slowly until we get to this period from the 1830s why we kind of increase the share of capital in the growth accounting calculation from the 1830s. So, TFP growth, very important for GDP per capita growth in Britain. All the periods of positive GDP per capita growth are characterized by strong total factor productivity growth. Uh, we now look at the Dutch case Van <coughs> Outen, Van Zanden, and Bos van Leeuwen um, did a growth accounting exercise for uh, the Netherlands. Um, they, they worked in terms of uh, the extensive growth accounting, but I think it's more interesting with the Great Divergence debate to do it in terms of uh, the intensive form. So we uh, sort of reworked the estimates on the intensive form basis. And here's what we get. Um, let's keep an eye on the top. Um, basically, very similar to the British case, when we have positive GDP per capita growth, uh, TFP growth is very important. 
In fact, you can see it's a period uh, 1540 to 1620 here, 0.78% a year is TFP growth out of the total GDP per capita growth of 0.87%. So almost all of the growth, again, is like Britain during its um, industrial revolution phase, innovation is really important. Um, <coughs> and um, that's the, uh, that's Northwest Europe, right? So if you want to understand the great divergence, I'm arguing we need to look at this, what's happening in Northwest Europe, what's happening in China. So for China, um, this is a little more um, harder to come up with the data. What we assembled here is the labor input, is just the population, that's, that's what it was in the Dutch case as well. Um, we don't have days work per year. Um, human capital, um, we've used uh, book titles available. So this, this, this was a, something which was used by Brewing and Van Zanden in the European case, and captures quite nicely the little divergence in Europe. Um, it's obviously uh, not as sophisticated as uh, the capital <coughs> estimates we've just been looking at, but then that's at the micro level. Um, the land, we've got the cultivated area from uh, 2018 Journal of Economic History paper. And, and a really difficult one is, is capital. And, um, I, what I've done here is to work with um, one of uh, Nicholas Caldor's stylized facts of growth. Uh, based on the 19th and 20th century data for largely Western economies, um, uh, he found that Basically, the capital output ratio over the long run doesn't change. What happens in development is capital per worker rises, but the capital output ratio stays pretty much the same. So, um, what uh, what we have been able to do is uh, have a look at what happened in Britain over the longer run in the 1340s. That's when our capital stock data begin for uh, for Britain. And it does hold over this period as well. There's no long-run trend in the capital output ratio in Britain from the 1340s to the present. Um, and um, yeah, so that's the assumption we're making. We're using the same frameworks as we have for Britain over the long run as well. Um, Here's how that turns out in summary form. Um, what are you finding? Well, you'll have seen from the graph that I showed you earlier of the Asian uh, GDP per capita that we're not seeing much growth here over the long run. And so the changes in the growth rate of GDP per capita, they're very low, whatever period we're looking at during the um, sun. And Ming dynasties. Uh, and it's only when we get to the Qing dynasty that things become uh, start to move around more. And um, we see positive growth during the Ming Qing transition, 1620 to 1690, dates we have because the data start to disappear once the fighting rates now um, too strongly. Um, and, uh, but then that's followed by a period of negative growth. And that's negative growth of both GDP per capita and TFP growth. So the only positive TFP growth we're getting is during that Ming Qing transition, which is a bit of a sort of, and this is a residual item, and the only other period is during the Northern Song Dynasty. Notice, during the Northern Song Dynasty, although you'd have the positive growth, which you might expect in this period of Chinese technological leadership, um, it's offset by negative growth of total factor inputs per capita. This is a period of rapid population growth, which uh, offsets the uh, accumulation of fixed capital, human capital. 
Um, so uh, this is just breaks, then breaks down the total factor in the book per capita growth into the various factors, human capital per capita, fixed capital per capita, land per capita, um, and um, basically you're getting a uh, slow change in GDP per capita uh, with predominantly negative growth that is a result of, of the rapid population growth, which is, means that although there's accumulation going on, it's not sufficient to offset the uh, population growth. I might just to sort of draw your attention to land per capita is kind of trending down. Uh, to me, um, is uh, is, it was always striking uh, before I started doing the growth accounting. Um, you know, when we were doing the GDP per capita study, you have to bear in mind agriculture's more than two thirds of output, um, and so as the land per capita trends down, so does the um, GDP per capita. So it's kind of consistent with Wang's work, which seems to be incredibly controversial. It's use of the term involution, but you know, it kind of ties in with that recently as well. Um, so, uh, if we're wanting to account for the great divergence, then um, I, I'm kind of reminded of uh, a statement by um, Deirdre Masuski which was in the in the, the first edition of the um, sort of new economic history of, of Britain all the way back in 1981 he, he, he wrote ingenuity rather than abstention from the industrial revolution what did he mean by that ingenuity was about innovation technological progress abstention was about saving so that you could invest in fixed capital human capital I think the intensive corn growth accounts in Northwest Europe and China, you know, are, are pretty much in agreement with Matuski's vision, applied to the Great Divergence. So, in fact, Northwest European countries forging ahead, and in the periods of positive growth of GDP per capita, we are seeing generally strong TFP growth. It's more about ingenuity rather than abstention capital D. <coughs> and as this is happening in Northwest Europe, uh, as we're getting the transition to modern economic growth after 1700, <coughs> it's important that China goes through into a negative phase of GDP per capita. Population growth is accelerating, land per capita is declining. <coughs> Uh, and, you know, although there's, there's accumulation going on, it's not at sufficient pace to keep pace with the population growth. So that's becoming new. We, we, also, TFP growth turns out to be slightly negative as well. So we're seeing TFP growth playing a, a crucial role in the rise of Northwest <coughs> Europe. All the way back to the Black Death, we're seeing very little. Uh, and TF, positive TFP growth in China um, beyond the, uh, the, the Southern Dynasty. So just just to sort of emphasise what what's going here and sort of tied a little bit to the literature on innovation in these economies. Um, uh, let's 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 have a look at what's going on in, in the sort of three periods that we can identify on the growth accounting uh, exercises I've just shown. So I think we're saying, yes, from about 1700, we see the level of GDP per capita beginning to diverge between the richest parts of Northwest Europe and uh, the richest parts of China. So in other words, the 18th century is the critical juncture here, not the 19th century. It's already underway during the 18th century. That's, yeah, that's a bit of a change from 
from Pomerantz, but actually it's further away from the old Eurocentric view. Um, so it's a sort of compromise position, which I think some members of the California School have been happy to at least say, well, we're not too far apart. That includes Ken Pomerantz. Things now it's the 18th century. Um, but at the same time, we can see that Northwest Europe and China are, are on different paths of innovation and technology going back much earlier. It's just that in the, the period from look at the Black Death through to 1700, Northwest Europe is catching up. If, if you think the long run trajectory is important, then I think we might want to also think, yes, what's happening after the Black Death? is playing quite important roles. So that's why I've divided things up into these three periods. 980 to 1400, 1400 to 1620, and 1620 to 1870. So what's going on 980 to 1400? What we're seeing in China, we have um, a period of positive TFP growth during the Northern Song Dynasty. Um, and that, of course, ties in with what a lot of people have written about some dynasty China. <coughs> and indeed, some of the innovations which are quite usually regarded as very central to the British Industrial Revolution are already being widely adopted in, uh, in some dynasty China. So the smelting of iron, the use of central power sources for spinning textile yarns, you have other industries that are way ahead of Europe, um, shipbuilding, porcelain. Um. But one of the things that, you know, that, that, that came out from the growth accounting was that GDP per capita growth were negative. negative. Why did we get that? Well, one of the great innovations, Champa Rice, you know, new varieties of quick ripening rice, results in a huge population growth. And so that offsets the, um, the uh, accumulation of fixed capital, human capital, so that fixed capital per head, human capital per head is actually defining. And that offsets the effects of the um, positive TFP. We end up with negative GDP per head. Um, in Britain, we get the post-black death growth um, in GDP per capita. Part of it is, is explained by the sort of lottery win effect. You've survived, you've got more land, more capital, and so on. But then there is also a role for TFP. What's going on here? How are inputs being used more efficiently? I think it's obviously not, it's not kind of great new inventions. We look at more um, structural shifts uh, within agriculture from arable farming, pastoral farming, uh, instead of uh, exporting all the wool, um, they're now manufacturing at home into cloth and becoming, working towards becoming uh, a major cloth exporter. Um, we didn't have data for the Netherlands uh, over that period, but I'm sure there will be positive uh, TFP growth there as well. All the input. Uh, the second period is 1400 to 1620, when really the, the, the critical change is what's happening in the Netherlands. The Dutch Golden Age it is driven almost entirely by TFP growth. Um, there are a number of innovations which get highlighted in the literature, in uh, fishing, shipbuilding, the herring bus, the bush um, Also, of course, Dutch famous for innovation in land reclamation, water control, and that applied to agriculture. So Dutch agriculture really develops a high degree of specialization. Uh, they give up on, to a large extent, on grain production and import that, and focus on specialization in, um, in high value added agriculture. Um, in this period, uh, 
1620, of course, we don't see any TFP growth in Britain, and that's not surprising. Britain is still regarded as a, a European backwater at this point. It is surprising, though, uh, in the Chinese case, having reached the heights of <coughs> great technological innovations during the Sun Dynasty. Uh, this is, of course, the Needham puzzle. And, um, there's concern. You know, why is it that China uh, didn't go on to achieve a full-fledged scientific revolution, an industrial revolution? Um, of course, there's big debates about that. Um, uh, Justin Lin uh, argues that well, China was doing very well uh, in technological inventions that required just sort of experience, people tinkering. That's a pre-modern way. They never make the transition to um, experimental science-based innovation, which came to dominate um, the modern world. Um, so then we, we come to the last period, uh, 1620 to 1870, and of course the, the, the key player here uh, is Britain. Starts to see a rise in GDP per capita. Uh, really quite strong growth, about almost 1% a year uh, in the second half of the 17th century, after the end of the Civil War. Um, and that's driven to a large extent by better use of inputs, TFP growth. Um, then we come to the period 1690s to the 1830s, when almost all of the GDP per capita growth is explained by, um, by TFP growth. The problem here is, is that there's an acceleration in population growth, um, and that holds back the growth of um, human capital per capita, and also fixed capital per capita. So yes, there's a lot of accumulation going on, but it's, it's just keeping up with the growth of the population. So everything then, raising living standards, depends on innovation, better use of inputs. And then, of course, we get to the, um, the, the, the innovations of the great inventions of the Industrial Revolution, one of which is the steam engine, which you can think of as a general purpose technology. It spreads right across the um, Yeah. So uh, then we turn to China. And what we get is a, is a burst of growth uh, across the Ming Qing transition. Of course, it's a lot of the data, we don't have continuous data here. We have to stop in 1620, we start again in 1690. Across that gap, there has been growth of GDP per capita and TFP growth. Um, of course, it's an enormous increase in uh, territory. Um, so, so you can think of uh, growth of, of the market. But this is obviously short-lived. You can't go on pumping more and more territory forever. Um, eventually, it will end in. Uh, and then, um, from 1690 to 1840, we get negative growth of both GDP per capita and TFP growth. And this is a period of rapid population growth. So land per capita is declining, very much in line with in Huang's view, the idea of involution. Um, and uh, there's also been some work suggesting that grain markets are becoming less integrated uh, by uh, Ben Boffin et al. Um, and that, that, that again is a sign of less efficient use of resources in negative GFP. So, uh, I've got to the end. Um, uh, a bit of time for questions, hopefully. Um, let's start late. Uh, <laughs> um, just to, to sum up, uh, we have the um, you know, great divergence it's beginning to show up in the GDP per capita data around about 1700, as far as I can see. Um, um, and um, it, it, it's because there's 
positive growth in Northwest Europe and negative growth in China. So sort of two together that gives you the great divergence. It doesn't mean that what happened before 1700 is unimportant. Because you know, we're seeing Northwest Europe gets onto this growth path um, after the lag there, begins to not have efflorescences, but rather a period of growth and then a plateau. Another period of growth and then onto continuous growth. <coughs> so it's already breaking free from that pattern of efflorescences. Uh, after, after, uh, in the aftermath of the Black Death. So, uh, so we get positive TFP growth in Britain in the period after the Black, immediately after the Black Death. I suspect if we had the data for the inputs, the same would be true of the Netherlands. Um, then um, in the, during the Dutch Golden Age, um, we're seeing, um, since 1620, we're seeing uh, Northwest Europe continuing to uh, improve. GDP per capita growth is driven by TFP growth, and then more TFP growth in Britain from the second half of the 17th century going on into the uh, Industrial Revolution. In China, yes, there's positive TFP growth during the period of dominance in the Song, Song Dynasty, um, uh, but then, um, then we, we, we get really stagnation and even negative growth, particularly during the Qing dynasty, driven by negative 